In this Biology 1440 lab, we are going to look at how hypo, hyper, and isotonic environments affect the appearance of plant cells and how the mass of potato samples change in response to varying concentrations of sucrose. So we're basically testing the effects of osmosis on plant tissue. One thing you'll do this week is we will have you make bulk dilutions. That means each table will be assigned a dilution and, and that table will make enough for the entire class for the day. So every table will test the same concentration, zero to one molar sucrose solution. But for example, table one might have to make enough 0 0.2 molar sucrose for the entire class. Then you are going to core your potatoes just like you did for the beets, the beet lab, into five millimeter thick slices. And you're going to take the mass of each one of those before you put it into their sugar solutions. You're going to record the mass of each piece and then place them into the solutions for at least one hour. And then you'll take them out, pat them dry, and take their mass after that hour of soaking in sucrose and you will determine the change in mass, whether they lost weight, gain, so they lost mass, gained mass, or stayed the same. So you'll want to set up your experiment pretty early on after your quiz um, and write out a hypothesis. Note that when working on your hypothesis, sucrose is a pretty big molecule that will not easily cross a membrane. Water, however, will have a much easier time getting across those cell, me cell membranes. So that may affect your hypothesis. So you don't need to worry about how a specific concentration of sucrose will affect the mass of the uh, potato pieces. But how will, how will the mass of the potatoes vary along those different concentrations? We are then going to do an observation using Elodea, which is an aquatic plant. Uh, we will place it in a hypertonic environment and a hypotonic environment and observe its cells under the microscope. And then hopefully we'll also do an endocytosis experiment using a small uh, organism that you will feed with ink, or at least bacteria that have been stained with ink. And as it takes in that food, you'll be able to see food vacuoles forming inside of that organism. Uh, so the process of uh, phagocytosis may be observable in lab this week. Then at the end of the day, you'll collect osmosis data. So some of our major goals, as for every lab, we're working on our teamwork skills. We're going to work on our data collection skills. You're going to make a standard curve again, and you're going to predict the concentration of an unknown sugar solution. So you're going to be doing that this week, and then you're going to be observing um, LOD and endocytosis uh, while using microscopes, so you should become familiar with the parts of a microscope this week as well. So just in case you need a little background on this, um, we have in this slide a membrane and molecules of dye on one side of the membrane and no dye on the other side of the membrane, and the membrane is permeable, meaning it has holes in it the right size for dye to fit through. One thing you have to understand to understand this diffusion is that molecules are in motion unless you're at absolute zero. So these molecules are drifting around and inevitably some will cross the membrane and over time they will be somewhat equally spaced out. Some will be drifting through from left to right, some from right to left, and they'll be pretty much evenly balanced. That will happen if you have one solute or even if you have two solutes in that situation. Eventually, they'll be more or less diffused throughout the system until they're fairly equally spaced. Now, just because they're, they're spread out doesn't mean they stop moving. They're still drifting around when they're at equilibrium, when there's equal concentrations on both sides. They're still moving, uh, but once they're spread out, Essentially, for everyone moving right to left, there's another one moving left to right somewhere in the system. So things balance out. 
This is the experiment shown in your book where they take a U-tube, U-shaped tube, and they have a low sugar concentration on one side of a membrane and a high sugar concentration on the other, and a permeable membrane between the two. Now this membrane is permeable to water, so it's selectively permeable. It lets water through, but it is too, uh, the pores are too small for sugar to get through. So that sugar cannot cross. So what happens over time? Well, water molecules are moving, sugar is moving, but sugar can't cross the membrane. So in this case, sugar cannot diffuse. If, the, if that membrane had bigger holes in it, sugar would diffuse uh, from right to left, and water would diffuse kind of from left to right, and you'd have an equal concentration of sugar and water on both sides. But that can't happen here because the membrane will not let sugar cross. So what happens? is sugar uh, stays over here to the right, but water is moving from right to left at a higher rate than it's moving from left to right. Now, why is that? Well, once again, water molecules are in motion. They're moving, so they're, they're going to pop into those holes just by random chance. But once they cross over to the right side where the solute concentration is high, they tend to form hydration shells with that sugar. They stick to it, and now they're part of this big sugar molecule with water stuck to it. That whole thing can't come back across the membrane, so that water is now bound. It's stuck to that large sugar molecule. This would be like you walking out into the hallway. You fit through the door, but then you sit down on top of a horse or you sit down on an elephant. Then you can't come back through the doorway again. So that happens. Uh, and, and you can see that the volume of the fluid changes on each side of that membrane in response. And eventually you have more similar concentrations of solute on both sides of the membrane. How does that happen? Well, you have more water over here now. So the water to sugar ratio is about the same over here now as it is over here because water has crossed that membrane. That is the process of osmosis, the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane. And of course, cells will respond differently to these situations. Animal cells, if you place them in what we call a hypotonic environment, which would be something like pure water, distilled water, um, this a hypotonic is referring to the concentration of solute in the solution that the cell's sitting in, in this case. So you plop a cell into a hypotonic solution. Hypo means less than. So this would be a, a solution of water with less dissolved substances than the cell has. In an animal cell, that means water flows in faster than water flows out, and the animal cell will burst or lice. In a plant cell, water also flows in, but eventually the cell kind of becomes turgid and stiff. It pushes up against the cell wall, but it does not burst because that cell wall now kind of counteracts the pressure of the water coming in. It can only take in so much, and plants actually like this situation. This is why... Um, you can water a plant and it might be wilted and then it comes out of it because the cells fill back up full of water and this provides kind of a hydrostatic skeleton almost for that plant. Isotonic solutions where concentration of solutes outside the cell and inside the cell are the same. So therefore the amount of free water is the same inside and outside the cell. So water flows in at the same rate that water flows out. That's normal for an animal cell. It's not too good for a plant though. That makes a plant cell go flaccid, means that that the, uh, the, the plant might kind of wilt a little bit. It won't stand up as straight. And then you place cells into a hypertonic solution. That's when the concentration of solute outside the cell is higher than inside the cell. So let's think about that in terms of water or free water. Let's go back to this slide real quick to just uh, reiterate this point. Let me get my mouse to work here. Um, Free water is the water that's not stuck to anything in a hydration shell, whereas bound water is stuck to dissolved substances, okay? So over here in a hypotonic solution, you have a lot of free water outside the cell. In an isotonic solution, you have equal amounts of free water in and outside the cell. And in a hypertonic solution, you have less free water outside the cell. So the water outside the cell is stuck to all of that dissolved stuff like sugar or salt or whatever it might be. So water will leave the cell faster than it comes into the cell. That water will then get stuck to whatever's out there, the sugar molecule or whatever, and now it has a much harder time coming back into the cell. So that actually has the effect of dehydrating an animal cell and a plant cell. Animal cells will shrivel up. Plant cells will plasmalize, meaning the uh, cytoplasm kind of pulls away and thickens up, and it, it pulls away from the uh, cell wall and kind of makes a ball of goo in the middle 
of the of the cell as we can see there so those are the three conditions hypo iso and hypertonic that you'll be using uh, in class you'll be using those terms you'll also be working with microscopes this week and I ask that you do not clean the lenses with Kim wipes only use uh, lens paper on lenses please and when you're at high magnification 40x which is a total of 40 times mag make sure you only use the fine focus knob when you're done with the scopes probably we will we might leave them out this week but if you are the last lab of the week wrap the cords up carefully and place them in the proper location in the microscope cabinet there is a guide in your lab manual um, I think these pages are correct you can double check but it's in the back of the lab manual with all the parts of the microscopes labeled uh, I'd like you to look at those because um, I won't quiz you this week on that but the following week you may well have a quiz that will involve some of the parts of a microscope so you're going to make observations of plants making a wet mount this week that's when you put a drop of water a leaf or the specimen and then drop a glass cover slip on there please do so carefully try not to spill the cover slips make sure you shut the cover slip boxes when you're done grabbing cover slips they spill easily and make a horrible horrible mess We'll be looking at Elodea under a microscope, which is cool because its, it's uh, leaves are really, really thin. So when you just lay them on a slide with a drop of water, you can see the cells. And so these are plant cells, these big boxes, and the green blobs inside are the chloroplasts, the organelles that undergo the process of photosynthesis. So we'll be able to see that. And we're going to hit them with hypo and hypertonic solutions of, of water. And we hopefully will see what happens. And uh, hopefully you'll see something like this occur when the cells dehydrate. We will also be looking at um, tetrahymena, which is a uh, ciliated single-celled organism, and we'll try to get it to eat. And if you get it to eat, it'll eat bacteria that have been stained with ink. It'll bring those bacteria in through phagocytosis, and because they're stained, you'll see the accumulation of ink inside of their food vacuoles. And, and then uh, what will happen next is a lysosome would fuse with those vacuoles and digest the contents uh, inside. So that's active transport, right? Or, or bulk transport, anyway. So we're going to collect our data. We're going, to we're going to then put together class data and look at the data together and discuss what happened. And you're going to um, test those known concentrations of sugar that we will make at the beginning and you're also going to test an unknown concentration of sugar and um, you're going to determine two things this week that you can't forget about what solute concentration was isotonic to the potato and I'm not asking which concentration that you tested was isotonic but using the standard curve what would be isotonic to that potato even if you didn't test it directly this week you can predict it and what concentration was the unknown sucrose solution you can do that also with your standard curve so you're going to do um, a lab summary uh, along with a figure and you're going and I don't want you to forget to tell me these two points of data within your summary so don't forget to do that that's really important to show me that you know how to do that all right so that's this week we're test we're looking at um, essentially osmosis and a little bit of bulk transport uh, phagocytosis uh, we'll be learning how microscopes work as well so it should be a pretty busy week um, and then after that we're going to move into enzymes so see you in the lab mm -hmm.